Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And it is my great pleasure to present our recent work on dynamic pricing with fairness constraint. So this is a collaborative work with my colleague, Maxine Cohen, and he's uh, in, the, in the Zoom now. And also my, my co-author and friend, Yini Wang from UT Dallas. So this starts from a personalized pricing model. So I don't know how many of you have experienced personalized pricing, but I'm pretty sure, like 99% sure, like you have experienced something similar. So when you are shopping online, for instance, you click into a product and basically the algorithm will give you, quote, your price for the product. And the pricing algorithm is based on the historical data, for instance, the historical purchase behavior and sales data of the customers. So let's say, you are a student living in area B, like in uh, HEC Montreal or University of Montreal. So you click this product, the pricing algorithm gets the knowledge from the database about historical customers' behavior, probably for some students living in the same area. And then it also recognizes that you are a student from this area, and then it basically assigns a price, let's say $70 for the product. And then you see the price and you feel it is too expensive. So then you choose not to purchase a product. So once everything is done, your whole shopping uh, process will be recorded in the historical database, which will be used to update the pricing decision for the algorithm for the next time. So of course, some of you might think like, if I shop online, probably it's not so common to have a personalized pricing to each individual, but still it could be common to be applied to a group of customers. For instance, the price is based on your geographical location. And the personalized pricing has a lot of applications from the traditional industries such as the insurance and the finance where the personalized pricing, I will say is pretty common. Like it's almost guaranteed everyone will get a different price, whatever product you wanna purchase from the insurance or finance industry. Or I don't know how many of you are gamers like me. Uh, I'm a gamer and I just bought a game uh, on the stream a couple of days ago. And for people who play games, you know, if you, if you are living in the US or Canada, the price is much higher than if you're living in Argentina. Okay. So this is a location-based pricing. Well, sometimes the softwares, they offer the membership price based on different customer groups and they realize that they can achieve a higher revenue by charging, really charging different prices to different groups of customers. But, you know, this is good from the retailer's point of view because it helps to maximize the revenue. But sometimes things can go wrong. Let's imagine that you are shopping for the same product and let's say you are a non-Mac user and the algorithm charges a price $70 to you. And then your friend is sitting next to you, right? Like you are using the MacBook Pro. And the algorithm typically thinks people who are using MacBook Pro is richer than people who are using the PC like me, right? Then they realize, okay, I can charge a higher price to you. So they assign a price of $140 for the exact same product to you compared with the $70 of the product offered to your friend. So obviously you don't feel good because why I should pay higher money because of the laptop I'm using. So of course you might think this example is a little bit ridiculous. So I just put this toy example up to motivate my talk, but unfortunately this is exactly what happened in the real life. So in the year 2012, Orbit found that they showed higher prices to Mac users by exactly the same uh, example I showed you. So Orbit for your knowledge is the parent group of the like a traveling website like Expedia. So Expedia is a subgroup of orbits. And some other example, for instance, uh, Uber and Lyft, they may charge different prices. For instance, if you are if you are calling for Uber in a community where most of the majority of the population are those underrepresented groups, you probably will be charged a higher price. So I'm not saying that Uber and Lyft, they are doing racial discrimination. I, I don't believe they will do that, obviously, but you know, all the prices are determined by the algorithm. And algorithm, they don't care about these things. They just look at the historical data and they fit the data and they do the optimization. As long as they find charging a higher price from this community will make the company more profitable, they will do so. 
as a result, there have been a lot of efforts in the legislation to guarantee the fairness in terms of deciding the price or doing the price discrimination. So for instance, uh, in 2018, the EU legislation prohibits the sellers to charge mm -hmm. different prices based on like nationality, the place of residence or establishment of the shoppers. So some other efforts from California, they, they, they decided that you cannot charge different prices for similar products just because of the person's gender. Right? And there have been legislation efforts from other countries like China, like uh, I don't know whether you know, there has been a notorious uh, news from, China, from a major Chinese online shopping website. They charge prices to loyal customers because they think loyal customers, they are willing to pay the price anyway. But again, this is determined by the algorithm. They didn't realize that. So as a result, in today's talk, I'm going to focus on how do we decide pricing algorithms when we specifically take into account the fairness constraint. So we're not discussing what is the right uh, definition or like a right notion of fairness constraint. Let's say uh, this actually has been done by a lot of research papers and we just take the existing fairness constraint and think about you are a retailer and you're still trying to maximize your profit or revenue, but under the constraint of the fairness. So specifically, let me first give a very high level idea of what is the fairness constraint we consider in this presentation. So first of all, let's look at the traditional way of price discrimination based on customer groups. So we have a customer from group A, who was charged $70 and from group B who was charged $140 for the exact same product. Obviously this is not good. You cannot charge like twice as much as customer from another group. So as a result, we can charge $80 for group A and $75 to group B. Although there are still slight differences, but customers are more acceptable. So as a result, this is the first type of fairness constraint we consider, which is so-called price fairness across groups, or simply put, group fairness. So which simply means the prices charged to different groups, they can be different, but they cannot be too different. So there it has to be an upper bound of how different the price can be to uh, charge to different groups. So another example is, uh, suppose you and your friend, you are like exactly the same type of customer group, and you arrive at time T and your friend arrive at time T plus one. And then you found you were charged $70 and your friend charged $140, which obviously is not okay because why should I be charged with a much higher price? But you know, if we can control the price so that the difference is a little bit low, then this is better. And this type of constraint is a so-called price fairness across time or the time fairness which means the prices charged to customers who arrive in different time within the same group, they can be different, but it cannot be very different. So of course uh, we can like have different types of uh, time fairness for one-sided control or two-sided control. So things uh, like, can I make it disappear? Yeah. Okay, that's good. So to summarize, we will call these two fairness constraints the price fairness because you are looking at the price. So in the second half of today's uh, presentation, like at the end, uh, if I still have time, I will briefly talk about another notion called demand fairness. All right. Yeah, so I need to... Yeah. Okay. So this is just a structure of today's talk. I'm first going to introduce the model and then the algorithm which deals with the price fairness. And after that, if I have some time, we will talk about the demand fairness and then conclude the talk. All right, first is the model. So the model is a classical personalized pricing uh, uh, model. So suppose we have a retailer who's selling a single product. We're not considering multiple products. So we're selling a single product across the time with the lens of capital T, so indexed by small t. So then we have N customer groups indexed by I. So the retailer will set a price vector PG at each time T. So the price vector is simply the vector of prices uh, targeted to each customer groups. Right. 
So then once the customer group received the price, they have a demand. So let's, uh, without loss of generality, we assume the demand is normalized from zero to one. And then the expected demand, given the price offered to the group I, is a so-called generalized linear model. So the generalized linear model, we have uh, a link function F, which is known to the decision maker, and a linear utility function, which is AI star plus BI star times the price P. So here, we assume that AI star and BI star, they are unknown parameters, and the link function is known to the decision maker. So this is a quite general model, which includes many popular demand functions, such as just a linear function. So if it is a linear function, then F is simply an identity function. Or it could be exponential linear, so then F is exponential function, or it's a logistic uh, demand, where F is a logistic function. All right. So now let me formally introduce the definition of the price fairness. So for the group fairness, it means we offer the price PIT and PJT to two groups I and J, which are different uh, groups. So we have to assume that their difference has to be smaller or equal to some delta IJ, which is greater or equal to zero. Right? So that means the prices cannot be too different, which is exactly uh, the type of uh, constraint of pre uh, presented in Maxine's earlier paper. And we also have the fairness constraint, uh, time fairness, sorry. The offer price, let's say we have a price, vec uh, price uh, vector over the time. So for each group I, the price offered at time T and the price offered at time S, their difference has to be small or equal to some sigma I. So where the sigma i is assumed to be strictly positive because if it is equal to zero, the problem is kind of trivial. Like we can never change prices. So there's no way we can do any learning. And also we have a time window which says as long as the two time periods T and S, they're not too far away from each other. Let's say they're small equal to K, then you have to satisfy this constraint, right? So of course, uh, for both of these constraints, uh, I assume there is the it's a constraint on their absolute difference. But you can also say uh, they are the one-sided control. For instance, over the time, you can increase the price or decrease the price only. But uh, here we are allowed to uh, have two-sided uh, constraint. So the objective for the retailer, so since we're still a retailer, we're not policymaker and we are not customer. So what does retailer care about? So you give me the constraint, I'm still trying to do my best in order to maximize my revenue. So the retailer aims to maximize the cumulative revenue over the time across all the groups. So where the expected revenue for each group is simply the price times the expected demand. However, since we have this fairness constraint, so we had to find the optimal price P star given we have the full demand information by maximizing the objective function, well, it is stationary, so it doesn't make any sense to charge different prices over the time. So if we know exactly what is the demand, we know the optimal price is stationary, right? This period, next period, they have exactly the same demand. The optimal price has to be the same, but they have to satisfy the group fairness constraint. So that means PI minus PJ for different groups has to smaller equal to this delta IJ. And since this is really a learning problem, we don't know what is the demand parameters, AI star and BI star. So obviously it is not possible we know exactly what is a P star at the beginning of the time period. So the retailer has to do some kind of price experiment in order to learn the demand information and then charge a price which is closer and closer to the P star. So in order to evaluate a pricing algorithm with demand learning, so we will use the performance metric called the regret. Right? I think many of you might have been quite familiar with that. So the regret is simply the revenue loss compared with the clairvoyant who knows exactly what is a P-star. So they simply charge P-star every period, but you charge a price PT, and that there has to be a difference uh, for the revenue loss. So any questions regarding the objective and the model? Yeah. Yeah, please. 
just to, just uh, I, I didn't get it full. You said that if we the demand is deterministic, mm -hmm. we don't need to change the prices. Yeah. The time. Yes. So you have one fixed price. For exactly. Time. Yeah. Because there's nothing uh, you have to do mm -hmm. about changing prices. But uh, after that, I'm going to talk about what happens if we have changing demand, like we have non-stationary demand over time. But as a base model, I'm just talking about the stationary case. I have a quick question about the constraints for the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, you were saying that you have a sigma i that depends yeah. only on the uh, group, yeah. uh, but uh, not on the time. So, for example, you would just need, wouldn't it be enough to define a time constraint that is a for sequential type time steps? Uh, so, can you specify a question again? So, like yeah. here, yeah, exactly. You have uh, that. Uh, yes, sigma i, so mm -hmm. like pi t minus pi s, uh, yes. yeah, so you got that sigma i. Would it be enough to say that pi t minus, ah, uh, no, okay, like the t equal to one and s equal to the cap t? Yeah, so if this is the case, then that means you are like uh, having putting a constraint over the whole time horizon. Yeah, yeah, but typically uh, we are just uh, putting a constant k here. So it depends on the policy maker, like you can change different values of k. So if the k is larger, then you are putting more uh, restriction. And you will see how does the k affect our performance later on, yes. and you will realize uh, what will happen. Yeah. yeah. So just a few technical constraints. Uh, we make very mild constraint. First of all, demand function f is differentiable with bounded derivative, and the revenue is also quasi concave in the price peak. So that's the constraint, uh, that's the assumptions we make. All right. So before I talk about our algorithm, I want to first give a quick review of some classical dynamic pricing algorithms and why they no longer works in our, uh, in our problem. So first algorithm I want to introduce is the so-called semi-myopic pricing algorithm. So there are many different types of semi-myopic pricing algorithm, but the most fundamental, like which even seems a little bit stupid one, is this pure exploration exploitation algorithm. So you have a time horizon of length t. What you are gonna do is first spend square root of t time periods just randomly charging prices to the arriving customers. So let's say we're talking about a single customer group, forget about a multiple customer groups. So we randomly charge prices for square root of t time so after that, we just collect the data and we estimate the demand parameters using whatever method you want. So it could be a maximum likelihood estimation or it could be a nonlinear regression. So once you estimate the parameters, you will calculate the optimal price based on the estimated parameters, right? So p hat, which is by solving the previous optimization problem, but with parameter estimation. So then in the rest of the horizon, it's called exploitation phase. You simply charge p hat, like again and again to the for the rest of the time horizon because p hat is considered to be the optimal price according to estimation. So why does this algorithm work? First of all, it achieves the regret of square root of t and it has been proved in the literature. This is the best you can do. So there's no way you can beat the square root of t regret theoretically. So the way we prove this is by bounding the regret from experiment phase and exploitation phase. From the experiment case, obviously the worst case regret is square root of t because you, you spend square root of t time doing stupid things, like right? charging different prices. So then when you do the estimation, so according to the classical like parameter estimation theory, I'm not going to elaborate more, you can prove the difference between your estimated optimal price and the actual optimal price is at most t to the power of negative one over four. So this is basically the square root of how much data sample you have in the, uh, in the ex ex experiment phase. So then the regret for the exploitation phase is simply the time of the exploitation multiplied with your revenue difference. Right, so t minus <coughs> of square root of t is the length of your exploitation, and this is the revenue difference. So the length obviously actually is dominated by capital T because square root of t can be neglected given t is long enough. 
And this is the critical thing. The revenue difference under P star and P hat, it can be bounded by a quadratic term of P star and P hat difference. The reason we can do that is simply by applying Taylor expansion until the second derivative. So typically here, in order, to that, in order for that to hold, you need to assume that the P star is in the interior of the price range. So you have a price lower bound, price upper bound, you cannot go outside this range. And typically the range is large enough so that P star is in the interior of the price range. So what is the good thing about the interior? Well, if you take derivative of this revenue at P star, it is equal to zero, right? So when you do the Taylor expansion, the first order term just disappears. So you're only left with the second order term. So then you simply plug in this estimation result into the quadratic term here, and you find the regret for the exploitation is also square root of t. So summing them together, this becomes square root of t. So the very classical result of uh, like very naive dynamic pricing algorithm. But why it no longer works in our case? So we have the group fairness. Remember that when we have the group fairness, we put a constraint on what prices you can charge to different groups. So in many cases, these constraint has to be satisfied with equality. Just imagine you are charging prices to a very group, uh, a group of very rich people and to a group of students, right? The, the best thing you can do is charge a very different price. But now with the price uh, fairness constraint, their difference cannot be too large. So that the uh, constraint will become equality. So once it becomes equality, that means you are no longer the P star. It's no longer in the imperial of your feasible region. So it could be on the boundary of your feasible region. So in this case, we can no longer do that quadratic bound. So what we do instead is the T of two over three and similar cost estimation result. The key difference is that now it can be only bounded by the like by their absolute difference of prices. So you plug in everything, the best thing you can achieve with the naive algorithm is t to the power of two over three. So which is not optimal, I guarantee you. Like with later I will show our algorithm actually does a better job. So another challenge is obviously from the time fairness, right? So most of the dynamic pricing algorithm, you need to change the price very frequently just to do all kinds of experiments. But with the time fairness constraint, that means you cannot change prices too wildly. So how frequent should we charge, uh, like a change the prices? This is another problem we need to answer. So our idea is to borrow like uh, the so-called linear UCD algorithm with infrequent update from the existing literature. And I'm going to briefly talk about how we are gonna do that. All right, so any questions before I talk about the algorithm? Okay, so I'm just trying to give you a very high level and intuitive uh, design of the algorithm instead of giving all the technical details. So we have a time horizon of length t, and we still divide the time horizon into the experiment phase and some exploitation, or I call it contextual bandit phase. All right, so in experiment phase, we have two incumbent prices. So these two prices are the one you want to do some initial experiment. So you will charge price PA for T0 periods. So I'm going to talk, I'll give you the value of T0 later. And then you charge price PB for another T0 periods. But since PA and PB, they can be quite different. So if you suddenly change from PA to PB, you might violate the time constraint. So we design a subroutine called move price to in order to slowly move from PA to PB. So probably you know the idea, right? So we have a regional price, we have a target price. So then we simply connect these two prices and divide the paths into like a small segments. So every time you only move a little bit in order to satisfy uh, the time fairness constraint and stay there for a couple of time periods and then move to the next. And this is exactly some uh, some policy government put, right? Mm -hmm. So you are, you are uh, I don't know, like you are renting homes and uh, your landlord probably increase the price every year, but 
Fortunately, our government put a 2% cap on how much you can price, how can you increase. And the landlord, they are very nice enough to take 100% of these 2% two, uh, two increase gap. So they, they are doing exactly the same uh, subroutine. Right. Then in the contextual value phase, what we're going to do is to divide into log t times of the price update. So we have log t number of phases of charging prices. So in each phase, we first estimate the parameter AI hat, BI hat using the nonlinear regression and data from the last update. <clears throat> Once this is done, like this is uh, where we use this uh, UCB revenue function. So we have a revenue function, but this time the revenue function, we have an estimated expected demand. So this expected demand estimation is from the uh, demand function of the expect, uh, expected uh, utility, uh, estimated utility, plus some UCB terms. So I'm not going to emphasize too much on this uh, technical part, but here I just have one thing to notice. So here we have a sigma i, uh, sigma i, this is so-called price variance matrix, so which is used to measure how much price variation you have. So typically, if you have a lot of price variation, it will be larger, like the sigma i will be larger, and this UCB term will be smaller. So meaning that you are more confident about your current uh, parameter estimation. So then you simply charge the price PT, optimizing the revenue function, the UCB revenue function, under the fairness constraint, right? Then you charge the price for the whole uh, face of this uh, from here to here. So anyway, at the beginning of the uh, phase, you may jump from another price from the previous phase again. So whenever you need to move the price, apply the subroutine in order to move from one price to the other. <clears throat> so now the question is, when should we have an update? So when should we update the price? Well, the trick is there have to be two criteria you need to make. So you need to make either of the, these two criteria and then you will update. So first criteria is if T is equal to two to the power of K for some positive integer K. So that means if you have, if you have experienced this phase have, for long enough, then you should update, right? Because you have done a lot of uh, work already. So another, uh, another criteria is that the determinant of lambda i. So lambda i is the current price covariance. So you are adding up all the price variation until the current period t. And you compare that with the determinant of sigma i. So remember, sigma i is all the price variation until the previous update. So for instance, you are here. Then your lambda i is adding up all the price variation until the time t. Uh, for sigma uh, for sigma i, it only adds up until here. So it doesn't include the time period in your current phase. So if you realize your determinant of lambda i is two times the determinant of sigma i, that means your price variation has been increased by a lot. So you have changes price quite a lot in the current phase. So which that means you should have another update for the new price. Okay. So to summarize this algorithm, uh, I I will skip the proof. The algorithm has a fair, uh, had the regret by setting t0 equal to square root of t, and the two incumbent prices can be arbitrary prices with constant difference. Then the regret can be bounded above by n times square root of t plus the terms related to the time fairness. So look at here, we have kn divided by sigma zero. So sigma zero is the minimum of this time fairness allowance. Just a few remarks. So first part, n times square root of t, this is from the contextual bandit phase by applying the UCB algorithm. So this is the kind of the, com uh, the common regret from the UQ, uh, infrequent UCB. The second part, so the regret related to the time fairness, obviously, is from incurring the move price to subroutines. You are slowly moving from one price to the other. And during this like a slow moving, you must incur some loss because of this uh, uh, time fairness constraint. Then what is the best thing we can do? So actually, we can prove there is no way that you can find an algorithm which beats 
the following regret lower bound, uh, regret upper bound. So it's n times square root of t plus kn divided by sigma zero. So obviously, if you compare our regret upper bound and the theoretical regret lower bound, you'll find that they're nearly, it is nearly optimal up to some logarithmic terms. So here, O tilde just hides some logarithmic terms, as well as the second part of uh, the regret from the time fairness. So the reason we can incur this lower bound is because n times square root of t, this is just the ordinary lower bound for this uh, contextual bandit or dynamic pricing algorithm. And this kn divided by square root, uh, divided by sigma zero is because of the time fairness constraint. So why it has this lower bound, you can, I just give you a very quick uh, high level idea. So imagine that at the beginning of time horizon, you know nothing, right? So you don't know anything. So you have to charge a price. So obviously the price almost, it's almost guaranteed this price will be different from the optimal price. And magically, just imagine in the second time period, you know exactly what is a P stop. So you only, you don't know anything at, a, at the beginning of time horizon. And after one period, you suddenly know all the information. So even like that, you are still going to move from your original price to the optimal price, which has to incur the regret at least this much by slowly moving from the original to the optimal price. So that is why we have such a uh, regret lower bound. All right, so any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the group of fairness will not play a role. Exactly. So this is like one insight we get. The performance algorithm is independent of group fairness, but obviously group fairness affects what is your optimal revenue. Right? If, you have, uh, if you don't have group fairness constraint, your optimal revenue will be higher, but it doesn't affect your uh, algorithm performance. So this is actually a kind of interesting insight. The group fairness affects the optimal revenue, but doesn't affect the learning algorithm. But the time fairness, it doesn't affect the optimal revenue, but it does affect the learning algorithm. So this is something we get uh, from the result. So next I'm going to talk about um, the non-stationary demand case. So obviously like non-stationary demand gives a lot of opportunity for the retailers to do some kind of price gouging. So this is graph showing the historical prices of the face mask on Amazon. So this is a uh, 3M, 9N95. So actually this is exactly what I did at the beginning of the pandemic. I just go to Amazon, look for the face mask, and I find that most of them are out of stock. For a few that still have the stock, the price is ridiculously expensive. So here, this um, on my computer is uh, yellow, but here it's uh, uh, pink. So this pink area, this is the price for the Amazon's uh, official seller of the face mask. So once at this time point, when we start to have the stock out, like uh, during the pandemic, you'll find that the, the blue curve, which represents in the price of the third party sellers on Amazon, they suddenly jumps very high. So meaning that when they find, oh, Amazon's official seller, they're out of stock, then we just increase the price to a very ridiculous level. And even then customers still going to buy that. So this is uh, what they do for the price gold. So obviously there have been a lot of efforts trying to deal with this price gold behavior. Like I believe, uh, I saw the news for a lot of Canadian provinces. Um, they kind of control the price of the grocery and some personal hygiene product during the pandemic. So they kind of put a cap on how much price you can increase. And obviously again, the retailers just take 100% of that cap. And over the time, they just even keep increasing the price until to the price of what we saw today, right? which is much more expensive than a couple of years ago. So, all right. So now let's look at how do we model the non-stationary demand. Recall that this is our demand model. So we have a demand function and we have unknown demand parameters. But now, instead of assuming stationary demand parameters, our demand parameter can be time dependent. So now we have AIT star and BIT star. So they can be time dependent and they can change over time, but we have a budget of how much they can change. So if you 
look at like the change, like one step change of these parameters, if you add it up over the time horizon, it has to be small equal to some uh, parameter VT, V capital T, which is the budget of change. So obviously if VT is equal to infinite, there's nothing we can learn, right? Because these parameters can change arbitrary way. And there's no way that we can find the optimal price in every time period because like they can do whatever they want. So before I go into the details of the algorithm, just let me give you a very uh, brief example of how we should deal with the non-stationary demand. Let's just think about a very simple example. So the demand is constant for the first half of the time horizon, and then it changes to another demand parameters and stay there for another half of the time horizon. If you know that, so if you know that the price, uh, the demand changes in the middle, what do you should do? Well, we just run our base algorithm Baku for the first half. And then at the beginning of the second half, we just throw all the historical data. And we run the algorithm from scratch because I know the historical data will not help me. Actually, it will make things worse. So that is what we should do. So we run the algorithm for half the horizon and we restart the algorithm and run it until the end of the horizon. Unfortunately, this is the idea life, right? In the real life, we don't know when the demand will change and we don't know how the demand will change. We only know the demand will change under certain budget. So what we should do? Well, then let's think about another ideal situation. Suppose we don't know when the demand will change, but in the ideal world, it allows us to run parallel instances of our algorithm. So we have two instances of our base algorithm. The first instance is to run it at the beginning of the time horizon all the way until the end. And the second parallel instance, we call it instance two, is to run from the time t0. Well, this t0 is something you can determine. So we run from T0 until the end of the horizon. So intuitively, if the demand is stationary, like if there's no non-stationary demand, instance one should always perform better than instance two, because instance one, it gathers more and more data, it gathers more data than instance two. But since demand is changing, now we're not so sure. So the idea is that if we find at some time period, instance two starts to outperform instance one. What is the implication? This implies the demand probably has already changed significantly. So we should restart the algorithm at this time. So illustrated by this graph, let's evaluate the per period regret, which is a cumulative regret divided by time t. So like ideally it should converge to zero as like uh, time grows. So this is a performance of instance one, this is the performance of instance two, right? Starts from T0. And we will realize that at this point, instance two, although it has fewer data than instance one, it starts to perform better. So it means probably the demand has changed by a lot, like starting from here. So at least from this time point, we should restart the algorithm because instance one is collecting too much garbage data already. But as I said, it, this is the ideal case, like uh, just summarize the overall idea. We just run the base algorithm and at every time period, we will perform some sort of test of where the demand has changed. So if the demand has changed, then we restart the base algorithm. If the demand is nearly unchanged, then we just keep running the base algorithm. So this is very high level idea of our algorithm called a FAPU master, or we call it master algorithm. But you know, we're living, we're not living the ideal world. So in the real life, we cannot run parallel instances, right? We cannot compare that. So how should we do that? So actually this again is an idea from the literature by Wei and Luo in 2021, a very nice paper. So the idea is by instead of running simultaneous instances, we run some certain probabilistic simultaneous instances. So what it means is that let's suppose we have a time, a time block of length two to the power of n. So n is to be determined. 
And we have integer m from zero to small n, so that each integer m will partition the time block into two to the power of n m sub intervals with equal length, which means each interval is two to the power of n minus m. And what we do is instead of rounding an instance on the sub interval, we will round the instance of the base algorithm with certain probability. And this is a probability on each sub interval. So if we have sometimes you see like at some time period T, it belongs to different sub intervals. It may have various uh, active sub intervals which have the instance of base algorithm. In this case, we will simply round the instance with the smallest M and pause all the other instances. So I know it seems a little bit confusing. So let me just elaborate using the graph. Okay. So this is a time with a length of two to the power of four. So we have 16 time periods. So when M is equal to four, we only have a single sub-interval, right? Two to the power of four. So for this sub-interval, we will run the algorithm, uh, the base algorithm instance with the probability equal to one. So which means I will always run a problem as uh, an algorithm instance on the interval of M equal to four. So when m is equal to three, we should have two subintervals, right? So we should have a subinterval here and a subinterval here. But since we just toss the coin and we find that we're not going to run the problem instance on these subintervals, then we don't have the in uh, intervals here. So when m is equal to four and equal to two, we should have four subintervals and we find interval two and interval four, they have problem instance and so on and so forth. So at the beginning of time period, like a t equal to one, we find that, well, we only have one problem instance here. So we're just gonna run this problem uh, algorithm instance. And then at time period t equal to two, what we find is that we have two instances running. So instance m equal to four, instance m equal to zero. But we can only choose one of them. So what we choose is we always choose the interval with smaller m. So now I'm running m equal to zero. So I will pause m equal to four here. So m equal to four will be paused all the way until at this point where there are no other problem instances running. And then I have to resume what I run in the first time period. So this is like running this algorithm instance from period t equal to one, period t equal to this number, next and third. So this is like running the algorithm with four time periods only while pausing all the way in between. All right. So this is the idea from the, uh, from the literature. So what is the key issue in our problem is, as you can see, we're jumping back and forth between different algorithm instances. So they may violate the time, uh, they may violate those uh, time fairness. So we need to take into account this and quantify how much uh, like we have to change from one price to the other by incurring the move price too. So this is a very tricky part of uh, our algorithm. All right. So now let me talk about what, how should we perform the test? So essentially, let's say during a block of length two to the n, which starts from Tn. So it's uh, like a problem uh, block, time block. So we will perform two tests. So let's suppose the demand is nearly stationary during this block. So what will happen if the demand is nearly stationary? First of all, the average demand, average revenue for any other M instance should not significantly exceed certain revenue upper bound. So revenue upper bound is based on the whole time block because revenue upper bound and average revenue for the other M instance, they should be very fairly close to each other given that demand is nearly stationary. So another fact is, if the demand is nearly stationary, the cumulative regret in this block basically should not exceed square root of t, right? Because square root of t regret is basically what happens when everything is nearly stationary. So this is the two facts will, which will be satisfied if the demand is nearly stationary. So the logic here is, well, if the demand is not stationary, at least one of these two tests will fail. 
So if one of these two tests fails, then we simply restart the algorithm, right? So this is the idea. So if either of these two tests fails, then we restart everything with n equal to zero. So we start with a very small block and keep increasing the length of the block. Otherwise, we just keep going to the next block, total power of n plus one. Just keep doing what we do. So this is the uh, this is the overall structure of the algorithm. So any questions regarding this part? Yeah, I know this is uh, quite a bit confusing. Uh, it took me a lot of time trying to understand uh, their probabilistic instance as well. Yeah. But anyway, just let me uh, ignore all these technical uh, technical difficulties and just show you what we achieved in the end. So this is the regret that we found for our master algorithm. So we still have n times square root of t, obviously, but the second part will not only be dependent on the sigma zero, but also be dependent on vg, which is a budget of change, as well as the time t to the power of two over three. So I know this looks a bit messy, so let me simplify this uh, regret a little bit. Let's say we ignore all these k, n, and sigma zero. So we only look at what happens with respect to t and vt, because these are dependent only on the length of the time horizon. So this is what we get for the regret upper bound. So the good thing is, well, this regret upper bound actually matches the regret lower bound for the common bandit algorithms with non-stationary environment existing in the literature. So this is the best we can do if we only focus on T and VT. But of course, I'm not claiming that this is the best we can do because in our problem, not only we have T and VT, but also we have K, we have N, and we have Sigma zero. So whether it is optimal up for these parameters it is still an open problem and uh, yeah, could be an interesting future research direction. Okay. So any questions for this, uh, uh, for the result? Okay. So now uh, let me just briefly talk about the demand fairness, right? So I still have uh, less yeah. than 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah. Five, yeah. five minutes, yeah. yeah. All right, so the demand fairness is the following. So I'm still charging $80 and $70, $5 to two customer groups. So let's say this is like a super rich people living in the West Mall, and this is a group of students. So like you charge higher price, but still like it doesn't feel so fair, right? Because under this, the demand uh, will be very different for these two uh, different groups. So this is exactly the idea of the demand fairness. Instead of looking at the price, we will look at what will be the expected demand under the prices charged to different groups? Just like when students buying a laptop, probably you will enjoy a big discount compared with the non-students. This is because we hope the demand will be relatively similar to each other. So this is a demand fairness constraint. So actually this has a lot of uh, applications uh, in the real life, like uh, some drugs, they offer lower prices for less developed countries. And we, like universities, they typically adapt the tuition to guarantee students from different backgrounds can have equal opportunity to the education. And we can charge different prices of the same product based on the geographical location, just like we charge a lower price for Argentina. I don't know why Argentina, uh, they, they did not seem to be the most poor people in the world. But anyway, so this is exactly the idea of the demand fairness. So in general, we want the expected demand of each group to be similar to each other. However, such similarity, I claim that it is impossible to be satisfied almost surely without knowing the demand, right? Because there's always a positive probability we make some error in the demand estimation. So we cannot guarantee everything is satisfied almost surely. So this motivates us to define the demand fairness as certain aggregate demand fairness constraint. So what it means, if you look at the difference between the uh, between expected demand for different groups, <laughs> and you add up over the time of capital of horizon capital T, it has to be smaller equal to sigma ij times capital T. <laughs> so where this holds with probability, 
at least one minus mu. So that is why I call it sigma mu aggregate demand fairness constraint. Because if you want to satisfy every period almost surely, there's no way without knowing the demand function exactly. But with this, it is possible. So I will just ignore the technical discussion. And in the end, what we can show is we are able to design a primal dual algorithm. But I'm ignoring the detail such that the demand fairness constraint under this algorithm will lead to a regret of n times square root of t, which means basically it doesn't affect our algorithm's regret because this is the regret without demand fairness constraint. So obviously, the lower bound is also n times square root of t. And we show that performance of a learning algorithm is independent of the demand fairness. And now let me conclude today's talk by just summarizing some key takeaways. So in today's talk, we develop data-driven personalized pricing algorithm with demand learning with either price or demand fairness constraints. And we also show the impact of different fairness constraints on the algorithm performances. So basically we show theoretically the time fairness affects the regret, but group fairness doesn't affect the performance of the learning algorithm because group fairness only affects the optimal revenue given everything stationary. And we also illustrate similarities and differences between the demand fairness and some resource constraint in revenue management problems, which is, a, sorry, it's a slide I skipped unfortunately due to time limit. And basically that's everything I want to talk about today. And thank you very much for attention and any questions are welcome. Yeah, thank you.